Kathleen Salinas, and I'm the program manager of Brentwood Arts Center. I thank you and welcome you to our virtual auditorium for BAC's Conversations on Art series with our host, Meg Linton, and guest artist, Dimitri Kozarev. Our executive director, Amy Gantman, regrets that she can't be here today, but joins me in welcoming you. Brentwood Arts Center's success is due to our incredible and generous board of directors, leadership council, donors, staff, faculty, and students who support the BAC through thick and thin. And I want to thank our anonymous donor who has made the Conversations on Art series possible for the next 12 months. We can only do all that we do because of our generous donors who believe everyone should have access to the arts and education. We'd like to be sure to mention that the new BAC campus in Santa Monica, located at 1625 Olympic Boulevard, is open and summer classes have begun. The campus is in close proximity to 18th Street, Crossroads School, and a metro stop is nearby. We are excited to offer in-person classes once again, so your contributions and enrollments in our courses are more important than ever. Our host, Meg Linton, and BAC's Executive Director, Amy Gantman, met at Otis College of Art and Design while Meg was the Director of Exhibitions for the Ben Maltz Gallery and Amy was the Dean of Continuing Education. The divisions collaborated on many public programs and we are thrilled to bring Meg's love and respect for artists to the BAC. Meg has been visiting artist studios for over 20 years in her various roles as Director and Curator of Contemporary Art Spaces in Southern California. Currently, Meg is lead producer on a documentary film about feminist performance art in Los Angeles in the 1970s and 1980s called Acting Like Women, directed by Sherry Galke. She's working on an exhibition about the artist Keith Julius Puccinelli that opens September 2024 at UC Santa Barbara, writing a novel, and of course, conversing with Dimitri for the BAC this afternoon. Welcome, Meg. Thank you, Kathleen. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, thank you to the BAC, our anonymous donor, and to everyone working behind the scenes to make this program possible. We're in the thick of summer, and I'm joining you from the Central Coast today. I'm on a little holiday with a few two- and uh, four-legged friends, and I really hope the Wi-Fi holds and that the dogs don't bark. So if they do, forgive me. Um, welcome to Conversations on Art and our virtual studio visit with painter Dimitri Kozarev. Before I introduce our guest, I have the usual housekeeping. We are recording today's presentation and we ask that you please mute your microphones and turn off your video. It helps avoid any feedback. And during the conversation, if you have any questions, please type them into the chat box and I will either work them into the discussion or ask them at the end. And in the chat box, you'll also see that we have put some additional information about our guest for you to peruse on your own. And there's also instructions on how to save the chat so you can refer to it later if you wish. I met Dimitri while he was finishing up grad graduate school at UC Santa Barbara and I was running the Contemporary Arts Forum. It was at a time, um, at that time he started a core body of work uh, depicting the landscape from the point of view of the road or the driver. And while Dimitri's painting has thoughtfully evolved in various directions, he keeps exploring this visual territory. I want to read a quote from a re review written by Annie Buckley for Art Forum in 2012. Kozrov's joyously complex painting revitalized the idealism and vigor of an earlier time, recalling Kandinsky's own radiant abstractions and in their hints of representation, those by Arshil Gorky. Like Kozrev, both of these artists often relied on memories of their homeland for narrative and emotional inspiration. Kozrev allows the inherent uncertainty and emotional cadence of memory to inform the physicality of painting. So I still feel this resonates with D Dimitri's work today, and he'll probably have some opinions about this as we move through our conversation. But I want to welcome Dimitri to the BAC. Well, uh Yes. Hi. Hi, everyone. I feel like I have to do some thanks, too. I want to yeah. thank mom. I want to thank my dad. I want to thank my family, my cats and Meg for including me into this uh, wonderful conversation. Yeah. Hi, everyone. I know there are some friends out there. Text me later, OK? <laughs> yeah. That's great, Dimitri. And also, just a reminder for everyone to turn off their video and mute their mics. Thank you. OK, okay. so we're going to we're going to dig into the work but we're gonna start with some studio shots. Uh -huh. So where are you joining us from, Dimitri? 
Well, right now I'm at home uh, because I'm too cheap to install Wi-Fi in my studio for two reasons. One is I'm cheap, and second one is I don't need it. So, as you know, to have a telephone is already plenty. In my uh, you know takes time <laughs> away from the you know my lazy practice actually. So I am at my home right now. And you can um, see my favorite poster on the back. What is it? Oh, it's the Cure signed by the all members. Oh, that's pretty great. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and where is your studio? You're in Utah. Well, um, I am in Salt Lake right now. Um, mm -hmm. So my studio is far away from home, but enough to, you know, use the bike. So let's say that way. I am located to just uh, south of downtown of Salt Lake. And my studio is in a, you probably can tell by the floors and windows, it's the oldest building, standing building in uh, uh, Salt Lake. Oh, wow. Yeah, it's actually quite lovely uh, brownstone. And it looks like you have good light. Yeah, and if you can look in the windows, uh, there are all bars behind. <laughs> if you see there's <laughs> a beer bar. <laughs> <laughs> so I look out in the window, there's like four dive bars just welcoming me. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. You're in yes. your element. <laughs> uh-huh. So, um, yeah, this is my current studio. I'm quite happy with it because uh, Salt Lake, for some reasons, uh, you know, we don't have a very vibrant art scene that supports younger mid-career or uh, blue chip artists. Uh, but studio spaces are really hard to find and they're relatively expensive. What I paid in Arizona is just, you know, that was a ancient history. Give us a little, your biography a little bit because we my met in Santa Barbara and then... But you just give us your trajectory of coming to the United States and to how you got to Salt Lake. Okay. Uh, well, <laughs> that probably will take more, more than just an hour. But just anyway, give to us make an abbreviated version. Okay. In 1990, I was a recent uh, 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 discharged soldier uh, from Soviet Army, kind of like goofing around during the uh, lovely uh, freedom of perestroika on our streets. Uh, I was hanging out with a bunch of artists. And by accident, I met my uh, future wife. Uh, she was an American exchange student studying Russian at our university. Um, took me a little bit of while to get to States because uh, to obtain visa for a you know twenty year old without a job, going to visit young girl, almost none, no chance. So I was rejected uh, once, and then things changed politically. I think, and that's what actually opened the some windows for us. So. I came to States on a tourist visa, and then um, our August 91 revolution happened. And we kind of decided together that I don't need to come back and uh, deal with all of that stuff again, and uh, got married and start my uh, you know life here. And you studied at Ohio University, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, uh, Barbara. Yeah, uh, 94, we moved to uh, um, Ohio uh, University located in Athens, Ohio. It was not really a choice. It was the first job for uh, Joanne to uh, start her career. And as a faculty, she had a really great discount. So I went to school, mm -hmm. did my painting there, um, painting degree there with a bunch of really cool guys. And um, uh, and again, uh, Joanne's job took us to UCSB. She was in the uh, English department at UCSB. <laughs> and uh, I applied for graduate school there. And uh, that's how I started. Mm -hmm. And then you ended up getting um, a job, tenured faculty job at Arizona, right? And yes, I did number of years as a lecturer at UCSB. And then um, after, God, nine searches, I was able to sign a contract with uh, University of Arizona. And I stayed there for almost 10 years. And then I resigned from my, te from my tenure for family reasons. So. Mm -hmm. But uh, but yeah. I still but I still teach on a part time basis. And anytime we moved into a new town, I just called the local university, and I, somehow I got a part time job. Oh, that's wonderful. <laughs> yeah. Um. So let's so tell us about what we're looking at because this really started this kind of body of work started when you and I had some studio visits when you were in graduate school. Well, this is later versions of it. Later, but. Yes. but this yeah, kind yeah. of territory, visual territory that you're dealing with? Um, I'm just, uh, the, the answers are really simple. Uh, you know, I always look out and uh, anything that captures my, uh, you know, imagination, let's say, uh, could be driving, you know, driving in a car or just walking in a landscape. I take pictures and then um, 
I still think that uh, a good artist is also a good designer. We should know how to use color, composition, space, and so on. And uh, and I don't pretend to be a you know great conceptual artist at all. Uh, my ideas are very simple. Uh, what I see, uh, we actually in Russian we have a saying that what I see uh, that what I sing about, uh, you know. And um, I still think at the end of the day we can uh, we should make you know a good pictures that people live with for a long long time because sometimes I look at an art uh, on the wall somewhere I'm thinking hmm, like in two weeks I don't think I want to look at it again. Mm -hmm. And that's so what, what, uh, what for you makes a good picture. Uh, again, very simple, you know, good colors, good sense of color, good distribution, good distribution of those colors, uh, strong composition, um, deep space. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'm not really looking for, uh, you know, uh, photorealism that might come in mind, but I'm just thinking, uh, yeah, I mean, when I was actually in graduate school, when we met, I made this clear decision to myself I want to make pictures that I want to live with mm -hmm. and if I can't afford other uh, artworks I'll use my pictures to decorate my walls mm -hmm. so it's very for me it's very, mm -hmm. but uh, there's also a lot of uh, things come in mind when I paint uh, all the experiences visual experiences that I had through life uh, growing up in Hermitage collection and uh, just seeing so many great classical art and then moving on to a contemporary art and uh, all of that pops up in my mind when I work on a particular picture and uh, mm -hmm. sometimes emotions take the uh, my direction more towards the uh, let's say some traditional painting ideas or, or you know go to more of abstract uh, um, um, when I was in Ohio University actually we had a great uh, set of teachers um, and one class I remember it was devoted to uh, abstract painting. It's never been really my mode but I've learned a lot of things about uh, painting through that. It's still a language uh, that you have to operate properly. So, so talk, talk to us about the perspective though because you've really and also you've got this feeling of where it is abstract but it's also there is this blend of representation with it so you had uh, to work on getting that balance for yourself over the years uh that i cannot really answer verbally uh it just just happens that that's how i think i like this balance uh, between known and unknown uh, um that's why i never really de delved in, right into a pure abstract uh, painting it was not really my interest I still want to uh, grasp and catch some moments that you can uh, that you can relate to, mm -hmm. and uh, and that's what I always wanted to do. This kind of balance between deep space, flat space, uh, representational, uh, more abstract uh, uh, forms, and to find that for me actually it becomes a really interesting cocktail. So I can choose which direction the painting can take to. Mm -hmm. So for the. Oh, I'm sorry. For the perspective, that's actually a, of uh, uh, this very distant relative of mine that I found in New York recently asked me, why you always have a perspective? And I said, well, you forgot. I grew up in St. Petersburg. It's extremely one point perspective city. Mm -hmm. all, all streets are uh, based uh, on that model. And it's just embedded in me. I can't get it out. That's how I think. It's mm -hmm. the space that I grew up in. And it's always come to me back. And the second one is the... Um, my first original technical art experiences were not really drawing or fine art or anything. I was uh, very involved in the uh, drafting uh, class for the engineering drafting. And, you know, there is clarity of line is the must. You can't uh, have anything beyond what you see and what you depict. And that was actually a really great discipline to learn. And um, from there, actually, then I moved on into more of a fine art uh, 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 and thinking of the as a fine artist rather than a technician. So were you, I mean, at one point, were you thinking that you would become a drafts person or an engineer even? Well, actually, I was drafts person. Uh, um, as a high school job, uh, I had this, we had this particular program where students were uh, obliged to spend one day a week in some kind of a workforce. Mm -hmm. And we had choices, and I chose the uh, uh, drafting uh, drafting office. So I was just there copying the uh, blueprints by hand with a pencil, and that's cool. So yeah, I guess you know, job training was just part of the your educational experience then. 
well, that's how they prepared us for uh, for the future. And I don't think any of us actually went through when, those careers. Yeah. <laughs> so talk to me about, because the ones we've been looking at, they're all monochromatic. So mm -hmm. what about the color shift for you? Is this Is this all seen as like one work or? Um, well, are they, is it like, is well, you hang them all tight together or yeah. are they individual or? Well, you can, uh, uh, the, this monochromes, they actually were meant to be, um, as a set, six of them. Uh, I, I don't think I included this, uh, the, the, the photograph, um, but, uh, they're about, uh, 24 is. inches by 20. Oh, there it is. Yes. Yes. I actually want, in this case, I actually went to, after the simple, you know, well, maybe simple, but uh, I always been enamored with the impressionists, how they depict, uh, you know, each hour of the day with the color changes. Mm -hmm. So that's what it, it, it kind of got started, got me started. At first, I thought maybe to use the same uh, scene like Monet with his, uh, with his cathedrals, same, uh, you know, same building mm -hmm. with the different times of the day. But then I realized, you know, let's make it more interesting and uh, use a different scenes and, uh, but that was it. Yeah, the evening scene, you know, uh, high end afternoon scene, uh, dawn, and uh, you, you know, a little bit foggy. So, um, but in my other works, I actually, right now, I'm actually experimenting with a lot of colors. Uh, mm -hmm. But I tend to swing. Sometimes I go to monochrome just to rest for about a year or two, and then come back to the uh, painting with the full color set. So right now, I'm actually uh, uh, putting more colors than I think I should, because I'm. <laughs> created this visual mess that I need to figure out how to sort it out. Well, and when you look at these, are these specific locations for you? Do you oh, know yeah, yeah, yeah. where they are yeah. or have you manipulated them so they're kind of these dreamscapes? Well, I um, most of my work comes either from sketching or uh, in case of car driving, of course, the snapshots uh, of photographs. I used to have like a camera in my on my old Saturn set up on the dashboard, just like so I don't have to constantly hold it in my hands. But anyways, uh, this particular <laughs> pictures, yes, these pl places that I visited myself, and uh, it's just from the uh, driving uh, moments. Uh, probably at this moment, I can't, well, actually I know where it was, it was made in Texas, so it's probably more Texas uh, freeways. Mm -hmm. And you've traveled, you've crisscrossed the United States, if you, yes, like, I've done a lot of road trips, haven't you? Plenty, well, this is my ninth uh, state that I live in. Yeah. So I, uh, I lived on the East Coast, I lived on the West, mostly on the West, and then uh, Southwest as well, of course. Texas was what most wildest place I've lived in terms of my geography. Mm -hmm. So this one, actually, it was a, a work that I did. Uh, it was, again, very simple idea. I was in a really long tunnel, and then I kind of like had this idea, you know, how to describe this feeling that being in a tunnel, looking out, and that was an attempt to do that uh, in this painting. So uh, lots of black, and then uh, as you see, little vignette of some kind of a, a landscape at front of you. So what's, because, you know, it's a nice shot because we can see kind of the layers and the textures that are happening, the stripes that are kind of going across in the black. But what's happening on the left it's my left where the, you have the red and almost, uh, uh, is that a tree silhouette or? No, it's the, uh, it's actually kind of my little mental thing. It's the, uh -huh. this is, a, 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 this, this is an exit that you don't go to. Okay. That's why, there, <laughs> that's why there's a little bit of a danger there. So just okay. choose, choose the right one. <laughs> <laughs> and you're making it an obvious choice. Right. And this is uh, all pencil, right? Uh, yes, this is a, I did a number of drawings when uh, um, we moved to New York for my sabbatical year and uh, we only had a kitchen table for me to work on. So I, I bought a big stock of the uh, Bristol paper at local Utrecht uh, store. And then uh, at night when my baby was sleeping, I would just sit there and drink beer and uh, make drawings. Uh, so these uh, sets were actually not my personal photographs, but the places that I know uh, of, and I found photographs from uh, other artists back home in Russia. So is this, 
So what are we looking at? Is this a driving road or is this a walking uh, It's road kind of, a it's abandoned uh, uh, rail war road oh. bridge and a railroad. Yes, I think that's what it was. It was this beautiful black and white photo with this, you know, disgusting smokestack, you know, and reminded me, uh, I also, you know, I probably should talk about later at some point, but um, a lot of these drawings were uh, kind of uh, reflecting on um, some uh, Tarkovsky films, his, uh, you know, utopian, this, you know, apocalyptic, post-apocalyptic landscapes. And uh, that's what I was thinking of maybe at that time. Mm -hmm. And how big are these? I mean, you said uh, you were working on your tabletop, but is that uh, like 18 by 24 or? No, larger than that. It's probably okay. 23 by 29 inches. I think that's the standard for this, uh, for this company. That was a large painting. Uh, it's about six, uh, seven by six, probably. Mm -hmm. I never finished it. Uh, I worked on it in uh, in Texas, <laughs> but this this young collector came in and he fell in love. And I said, "Hey, I have no problem. Take it off my hands, especially this large size." <laughs> so is this kind of like a crazy intersection with all the wires and the? Yes, uh, I can't remember. I think I found station this. or. I mean, it looks like a shopping center of some kind. There are, well, you know this, I think it's uh, um, more for Texas uh, roads. They call it the spaghetti bowls or something. Oh. This large, crazy intersections where there's so many exits and entrances meet together. So we live near one of these. And I think that's where it is, actually. There was several lanes. You have to really be uh, attentive, which, you know, because even... Even on an easy American roads, that was really a bit crazy. And I think I was trying to depict the chaos there. Mm -hmm. and, my, and what I really actually, what really got me, there was several pedestrian cross across, you know, across the freeway. That was really crazy. Yeah, I haven't seen that. I've been to oh. Texas, but I haven't seen that. <laughs> you should come to Austin. Uh, and I think Austin actually became even worse. Uh, so much traffic there now. Yeah, so many people moved. Yeah. Yeah. And then this, well, this is a painting. Really that, different. Uh, well, that's when we met, Meg. This is probably my uh, either graduate or maybe postgraduate work. It was 99, I think. I was mm -hmm. working for my uh, MFA thesis show. And uh, and I was so enamored with a, a California landscape. I was trying to create this. In this particular case, I was trying to create this landscape mandala in a way. This continuous, you know, mount range with, a, you know, this beautiful... Uh, pine trees that are um, weather eroded on a, on the cliffs mm -hmm. so I think that was, this was my uh, attempt I, actually I was thinking more of the this painting as a design uh, poster rather than a painting how big is it maybe for a surf shop or something yeah how big is this painting uh, four by four. Uh, just to give you all uh, my kind of idea of sizes I usually start with a four by four and go higher to maybe six by seven that's my range, except one body of work that we'll probably see later when I was COVID ridden uh, in a living room. So I had to paint 12 inches by 12 inches. And you paint only in acrylic, right? Well, I was trained. Um, Soviet education was really, uh, uh, you know, very tight about usage of materials in the young students. Uh, when I was young, it was only pencil and gouache. Gouache was a really cheap material and very, um, in terms of consistency, it remains of uh, oil paint. And oil paint was allowed to use to, uh, to use only to uh, more senior students. So mm -hmm. um, I start. Uh, I, I was trained in oil, and then um, acrylic uh, came later in the states, and I kind of liked it a lot because it dries fast, and you can do the same effects if you know what you're doing. Mm -hmm. the, all the sets of tools that are now available um and then when my daughter was born it was just more of a, a, a healthy reason so and i had a studio in a, in a house at the time so i switched right. to acrylic and never came back to oil and usually it's just a canvas a traditional canvas and you were kind of the you know you were the kind of the primary caregiver for Lena growing while she was growing up right yeah, yeah good almost five years yeah yeah I, uh, you know I it was it was actually great and now she's going to college so it's weird yeah 
you're gonna have a lot more free time oh i no she's so uh, self-sufficient uh, she's got a job so i mean i don't see her at home at all. <laughs> so talk to us about these well these um, you know um probably maybe uh for some of you uh the question would be why blue and yellow it has nothing to do what's going on right now but for the past two years in my uh part of the world right. i'll just i always love that combination yellow and blue it's just great uh striking combination and it only later occurred to me when all the uh um hell uh got loose uh in eastern europe uh, that i'm basically using the ukrainian flag as a model for my paintings now i do it more uh deliberate yes uh my position mm -hmm. probably speaks in these paintings um hmm. uh for, uh, but this is was painted probably 2018 17 um it was just simple uh, uh idea of using uh, this really striking colors and transfer it actually into a california landscape yeah, because I'm I'm here on the central coast right now, and it's like these are the colors now that the the you know all the the foliage has dried out, and it's all yellow, must that right. beautiful mustard yes. gold before it turns yeah. brown, and then and that it, dark blue sky, it's just it's right. incredible. And that's what and you see actually on those beautiful uh, coastal uh, uh, cliffs there. You know, it's just yeah. bleached uh, uh, to yellow grass with a gorgeous blue sky. And have you studied? like the early California landscape painters? Not uh, in, uh, um, not let's say not in the organized terms, but I know mm -hmm. enough uh, through uh, living in California and just, uh, you know, uh, seeing people and, you know, yeah, I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm familiar, yeah. Um, what are we looking here? It's again, Helen uh, and Heaven painting. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so is this uh, an intentional diptych? Uh, it is a diptych actually uh okay. and it just sits right now at the gallery here in salt lake and i'm surprised it hasn't so get sold it's just you know small little thing buy it please <laughs> so how big are these uh they are 24 by 24 um okay. and again it was the idea of this you know the let's say fires on one side and coolness on the other side so mm -hmm. and definitely left side was uh inspired by uh, those fires a couple of years ago you guys had in california yeah. I mean, you have them every year, but there was one particular year when the sky was pink all the time. Yeah, because they were burning. There were like nine major fires going at one right, time. Right. Yeah, yeah. And then sometimes, you know, um, as any painter, uh, you find your little formula and then you execute it in a number of times in a different variations. Uh, nothing wrong with that. But for me, when it becomes 14 or to 20 of those, it becomes boring. So it's time to change and do something interesting and new. Mm -hmm. I like how you've chopped up, chopped up the sky with that one blue patch where you've got the hard line going through the clouds. Well, that's a homage to uh, Cezanne and uh, Cubist mm -hmm. followers. Uh, I always love that, uh, uh, it's especially a uh, uh, very subtle, breakage of space like Magritte sometimes does in his paintings there's this little moment that kind of offsets you and that's really interesting to me to create this little visual uh, I don't know landmine if I say mm -hmm. like, you know something you look and look and then you know it explodes later you know okay well now we're moving this into my new body of work right the most completed, let's say. Uh, this is this is my uh, uh, COVID body of work. Um, I was uh, uh, at the beginning of a COVID. I just moved into a new studio at the residency. Uh, we have this local program here at the uh, um, Museum of Contemporary Arts, and I was lucky enough to get a studio. And then uh, I moved in, and a few weeks later, they tell me you have to move out because the whole county, you know, is going on a lockdown. They gave me two hours. And, you know, I just moved the whole studio there. They gave me two hours. I, I dropped in a box, few things and uh, left and the building was completely closed. So, and I start thinking what to do at home, uh, because if you remember, we didn't know how long it's going to last. And, um, uh, and then inspiration came in. Uh, give me one second. I should have been more prepared, but I'll show it to you. Okay. So back in uh, in Russia, we have this very ancient traditional art of uh, uh, locker box paintings. It's extremely beautiful, egg tempera um, 
tight miniatures takes about a year to finish one and uh, i as a kid i've been always in love with the colors uh, you know it's a it's a black format you know black background mm -hmm. and it's my it's mother collect my mother collected them i want to see her collection maybe okay <laughs> <laughs> anyways um I always liked it. And uh, so when the COVID came in and uh, I had this, actually I had this three small panels, someone uh, prepped them with a black gesso and I was like, well, that's time. So I went online, started researching their techniques and how they do it. And, um, you know, I made a clear decision not to copy it because it's just, I don't like to copy things. I wanted to invent it, but uh, uh, be inspired by that. And uh, it's it sprang into a body of work, almost 20 works. Uh, it's very tight little paintings. They're about ranges from nine inch by nine inch to 12 inch by 12 inch. And uh, right now they're all framed and uh, you probably have seen in that studio shot. Uh, they're on my wall right now. Um, and when I exhibited them, uh, I exhibited them with along uh, with my collection. And uh, I didn't want to make the collection as part of my show. So I did uh, a proper introduction. We put the text on the wall. We introduced all the artists who painted those boxes. Uh, as much as information I could get. Right. So, and give them credit because most of this box has never been seen publicly. It was uh, uh, probably uh, tourist purchases in the 70s, 60s, and 50s, mm -hmm. uh, where Americans that came to the Soviet Union, uh, they would buy them at, even by those uh, the prices were just dirt cheap, 20, 40 bucks. Uh, now they go into hundreds and depending on any artist. Right. And the the um, but they also how did the tradition start? Because didn't didn't it come? It, it started with uh, something because weren't they painting icons and then all? You're absolutely right. Yes. Yeah. And then they went into the kind of the fairy tale. Yes. Um, stories because these have a very you know yeah. they've got the forested landscape, so I almost right. feel like you're not doing the characters, but you're doing everything. No, um, yeah. I took the figures out because I don't want to create yeah. another fairy tale. But yes, you're absolutely right. The tradition goes back to uh, uh, the, the the icons, and uh, that village was particularly known for their specific style. Uh, and the village is called Palech, a uh, very uh, small town outside of uh, uh, Moscow, and mm -hmm. in, in 1920s uh, their uh, art began to fail because uh, the religious themes were forbidden by the uh, red government. But uh, there is, was, uh, there's a story, a uh, famous uh, uh, revolutionary uh, writer, Maxim Gorky, came to the village and talked to the elders and uh, kind of pursued them that to change their subject and to concentrate first on the uh, more um, propaganda, well, I, I get, a, a git prom uh, type of work um, where they would depict you know soldiers and all of the you know the new people of new revolution so that phase uh, didn't last long uh, and then they switched into fair tales fair tales are really neutral mm -hmm. but some artists that i've seen they put some really interesting visual little clues that you will see sometimes you see this what looks like church and there is a cross you know really on the background i have a few of those boxes and they're really actually precious because you could tell it's not just a stamp for the tourist. Right. It's uh, yeah, the, each artist is uh, has an individual style and individual ideas. Um, and to find uh, the early ones, uh, it's much more difficult because uh, they were rare and they're definitely like in some private collections like mine, you know? Yeah. So. What are we looking at here? Oh, uh, that's the uh, uh, scene from, um, Stalker. If you remember when they enter the zone, the Tarkovsky film. Oh, Stalker. okay. Yeah, yeah, when they enter the zone. Uh, so it's kind of my interpretation of that still. Um, some years ago in New York, there was a great show of uh, um, um, someone put the uh, Polaroids of Tarkovsky the way he. There is also a great book on them too because he constructed his uh, scenes as almost like a. a you know, still life sets. Mm -hmm. Every detail is so important in his picture. You know, it's not just his camera moving around. Each shot is a is a painting on its own, and I always like that idea. And uh, so I borrowed some of his. That's what we do. We borrow. Made it, and you, made it, made it your own. Exactly. Oh, this is my early work uh, from uh, uh, probably my first exhibit, first or second exhibition in downtown LA. 
I was really interested in uh, uh, extremely fractured spaces, um, almost chaotic and. Um, yeah, because this kind of shifts like you're going forward, but it also has almost an aerial perspective as well. There was that too. Uh, I, I think I remember at the time I was interested how to bring a uh, uh, linear perspective and aerial perspective in the same picture plane. Mm -hmm. These feel like multiverses. Yes, and I'm not sure if I like, like the fracture in time or if I know you probably don't like that, but it does have that kind of sense of fracturing. Right. Um, yeah, it was uh, also part of the, well, some of this works also was uh, reflected in my life at the time, very hectic. Uh, for about a year and a half, I was commuting back to uh, between U of A and Austin. It was really annoying. Mm -hmm. You know, planes nonstop and the cars, if you miss your connection and so on. Uh, and I would uh, say that that period of my life was extremely destructive in terms of my studio practice. And in the end, I actually resigned from the uh, distance uh, teaching. Mm -hmm. And then it's lots of experiments with colors and uh, just to see what I can get out and how much I can stretch. Magenta, I really don't like that color, but I, on purpose. <laughs> <laughs> I just, you have to try it on, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's uh, it's kind of like, a, you know, a, a, rock in your shoe you know you walk with it but you need to kind of deal with it as well so that's how i see some uncomfortable colors that uh, i bring in my uh, uh, in my palette so when you're creating a piece like this or even the other ones that have the multiple perspectives or vantage points are you are you drawing this all out and then going in and painting or and do you well, i don't do, i don't do sketching uh, um okay. Uh, I find it a waste of my personal time. Um, I do sketching there for very technical reasons, or mm -hmm. I do full, fully developed drawing when I go into it. And that fully developed drawing becomes a painting, actually, in some ways. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I, I, most of the time, I do have a, a very rough uh, image that I want to work with. Mm -hmm. And uh, I either quickly draw it out on canvas with uh, wet, uh, wet paint or uh, you know any dry material. Uh, and of course, as many of us, I use the uh, uh, projection on a large pieces. Mm -hmm. It just saves time. Uh, and uh, right. yeah, uh, on a sm smaller pieces, uh, I do it by hand. Uh, mm -hmm. Just yeah. Um, and then how how are you picking your colors? Do you like to find your palette beforehand, or do you do that as you go? No, it's very uh, intuitive. Is it intuitive? Yeah, yeah I, I know some painters, they're very methodical about their color choices. They have all the scales and all that. I was horrible when I was a student in uh, high school at math and all those, you know, what we called hard sciences. Mm -hmm. It still annoys me because, you know, too many steps before you get to the product. So uh, all of the stuff that I do, um, you know, I have a general kind of a abstract original idea and then everything what happens later, it's uh, it's intuition. Um, again, thinking about uh, in a our historical kind of perspective, thinking about artists that might remind me, say, like this tree, for example. I remember thinking of uh, um, um, Corot, uh, one of my favorite uh, French painters, the way mm -hmm. he depicts his trees, and uh, I was trying to mimic it in some ways, you know. Yeah. So I usually uh, call. Does, it, does the composition lead you first, or the color lead you first? Sometimes. Colors come later. Um, sometimes colors become just whatever's closest on my palette to me, that will be the color, you know, because sometimes I find jars of paint stuck on the back of my table that I forgot about. Then uh -huh. I pull them out and start using them instead. So it's this, okay. this is this kind of strange, uh, you know, bustard way of painting. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Well, it's, I mean, it's work walking the edge, right? So it's this balance. Yeah. 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 I mean, I always composition and intuition, yeah. you know. I always think of uh, painting is uh, it's the kind of like a kid's messy room that you have to make sense out of it. You know, it's just like box of Legos. You dump them on the floor and then make something out of it. So mm -hmm. I dumped all of stuff, uh, paint, uh, uh, shapes, uh, textures, and then uh, when I start feeling there's some kind of a focal point started, kind of like see, you know, I could see through somewhere there. Then I start pushing painting that direction. Mm -hmm. Sometimes editing out, uh, out so much stuff that you've seen in the original in the first uh, few days. And sometimes painting takes a, such a turn that it has nothing to do where I've started with.
Do you ever think about the emotion, the emotion that you're conveying in your paintings? Yeah, uh, like in this one, uh, yeah. red building. Very and moody. <laughs> It's, uh, I was thinking of actually dangerous uh, uh, moments in this painting. It's, uh, uh, you know, do you want to get close to that building? That was, I was thinking, yeah. Um, of course, yes, uh, emotions do take a big uh, part in painting. You know, and colors, you have, I'm sorry? Do you, have, do you have titles for the individual paintings or is it just the series title? I usually call series. I, I just never like to put in, you know, this, you know, bring the, I, I, you know, I'm not a very good literary person uh, in either language, so. I don't like to bring any extra meaning that might challenge uh, what you see. Mm -hmm. I mean, when I look at a painting uh, of other artists, I, I don't care what they call them. I look at uh, visual image and then, uh, you know, that's plenty enough for me. Mm -hmm. So yeah, usually I call, uh, there is a series, ongoing series like Lost Landscapes and God only knows how many numbers there are now. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, because you said you had kind of steered away from this for a while. And then yeah. pulled back. I had several, uh, I had maybe three major series, maybe four now, uh, that have individual, not individual, but the different title for the whole series, because some paintings went, uh, uh, you know, away from landscape and uh, used uh, uh, different ideas. Mm -hmm. This seems like you're using more glass, like there's the transparent panels. Mm hmm. I really do like the uh, glazing effects. That's one of my favorite part of the old masters to uh, to use transparencies. And uh, uh, it actually really helps to add to a sense of deeper space. This was painted in Arizona. Actually, it's Phoenix. It's uh, when, you, <laughs> when you enter or leave Phoenix uh, uh, on Freeway 10. Uh, it's by the airport area. Is that the, it's not the Superstition Mountains, is it? Yeah, is that what it's called? You see them from the freeway when yeah. you drive by. Is that I what they call? I think they're the, the Superstition. I would I always call them the Suspicions, but I kept getting corrected. <laughs> okay. I never knew the, the title, but I always liked the, that particular moment uh, uh, there. Yeah. 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 So this is a, from the, my chaotic, uh, 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 say, part of my life. Uh, I'm not sure mm -hmm. if I like these paintings anymore. Uh, I'm glad there were some really good people who liked them enough that they have them in their houses. Mm -hmm. I, hope I hope they're satisfied to live with them uh, for the rest of their lives. There's a lot to look at for a long period of time. Yes. Um, now I'm trying to simplify things uh, because so much chaos already outside of our uh, daily lives that I'm trying to calm down. Mm hmm. Yeah. So is painting a peaceful process? I mean, peaceful. Does it soothe you or do you get? Um, lately, it became a kind of a is that what you, I, it became kind of like is painting a, that, torture a, for you sometimes. Well, is right it, now, it's a, right now. Yes, it's a torture. I actually kind of force myself to do something that I really don't want to do. Um, uh, and I don't know what it is. Uh, well, probably there's a whole complex issues there. But uh, yes, used to be, yeah, I would spend in studio days and days, actually. Now, um, lately, it became kind of a work. You know, that's what I do as a professional artist. So, mm -hmm. for example, last year, I completely abandoned painting practice, actually, even more than a year. I only worked on a, um, on a graphics. Uh, um, I have sets of uh, uh, this medium-sized uh, sketchbooks and uh, mm -hmm. I would do, would set up me a, I will set up me a goal um, one drawing in every three days a fully developed drawing that you're happy to frame and put it in a display it's mm -hmm. not just sketches or doodles in a journaling type it's uh, each right. uh, drawing takes number of days and uh, that's what I've been doing it was really helpful to uh, stay away from color uh, and not to think about color at all just about uh, uh, form and object and that, has that been a good break for you as you kind of enter back into painting? Uh, it was, I thought at first, but now I'm struggling in ways. <laughs> but... Yeah, yeah. If you look at my studio shots again, you will see there is a bunch of started and uh, none of them are finished uh, uh, works. Um, and sometimes I just come in a studio, I look at the painting for three, four hours, and then I go home and I don't do anything. Mm -hmm. But then this I start to realize... very vertical. I'm sorry? This one feels very vertical. 
compared to the linear ones we've been seeing? Uh, yes, because there is less, uh, 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 you know, centralized linear space. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah this uh, this it was a series, and this part of the series I was called. I think it was called Lost Age. When I had number of photographs uh, uh, that I used from archives and uh, some personal archives uh, of destroyed uh, uh, military lines outside of uh, uh, my hometown, um, they were um, from the Finnish uh, Winter War, uh, Finnish Soviet War, uh, when 1939 precursor to World War II uh, for Soviet Union. But anyways, uh, I was really interested in uh, how landscape also uh, changes what we do you know and that was a uh, an attempt to show that uh, everything decays at the end and uh, but scars remain the human scars yeah yeah and the the destruction and then the reconstruction and how it's completely yeah. yeah and you know as a kid i was remember going up walking through those forests and you see this bizarre trenches and you start thinking why they're in a deep forest and then you start hearing uh, as in my case from your grandparents Oh yeah, you know that's where the Finnish lines were. That's where the Soviet lines were. It's just very complex to think about. Um, and actually, if you look at this drawing, particular drawing, it was from the photograph outside of my hometown. And if you look, uh, right in the center, there is uh, an exploded shell from the World War II. And it was a photograph of some friends who were there, and they found it. And, um, you know, I made a drawing out of it on a very emotional base. Um, yes, another from that series. Um, when you was still the last find... time you were back home? Uh, back home, uh, 2017, mm -hmm. something like that. I was supposed to go there just when COVID started. So everything got delayed and uh, canceled. And now it's even more complex. Yeah. So you find them, uh, you go in, on, especially northern part of the uh, forest at South St. Petersburg towards Finland, you find them all the time, this uh, uh, destroyed bunkers. They sit there. And there is kind of this uh, beautiful kind of, uh, you know, morbid Gothic even, you know, feel about them. You know the horror that happened there, and that just like, they're all decayed, abandoned, and they sit in a deep forest, completely surrounded by green in the summertime, um, and yet still looking very dangerous. Actually, mm -hmm. there very are even some, sometimes there's still. It, is it concrete and wood? Yeah, yeah, yeah. no, it's a yeah, it's a concrete and uh, and steel. Okay. Yeah, yeah that's that's actually what held uh, uh, Red Army uh, uh, to. Uh, uh, advance deeper into Finland. And again, just an uh, um, idea of how much wasted resources, lives, time, everything mm -hmm. so for this uh, particular one, three months long event. And what was it for? I don't know. I mean, some Soviet historians claim that, oh, yeah, we moved that border by 80 kilometers or so. Mm -hmm. Who cares? Really, who cares? <laughs> right. Yeah. I really love this image because it's almost as if it's like the seams are bursting. Yeah, this is from inside. Yeah, picture yeah. was taken from inside uh, of the bunker. Uh, and I thought it was extremely uh, beautiful and challenging uh, image to, to work with. It was one of the first from this series. And uh, it's, again, 29 by 24 inches. Mm -hmm. and that's what I actually call it in my case a uh, fully developed drawing that you can exhibit it as a, a you know individual piece it stand, stands on its own I hope that's how I approach things uh, and and yes. To, yes yeah this is a good exhibition uh, 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 shot yes so and all this, of this, this is just in 2021 20, or 22 21 okay yeah. Mm -hmm. It was uh, the culmination of my residency. Um, we were supposed to be there for, uh, I can't remember, a year maybe, but COVID extended everything for me. So I stayed in that museum for almost two years. Wow. And um, at the and end of the residency. You your collection of boxes too. I yeah, we, uh, yeah uh, because I wanted to give them, uh, those artists, uh, uh, you know, um, proper exhibition. Because like I said, most of those boxes never been in public. Mm-hmm. And uh, I 
think of them as a uh, you know paintings this is a, just a slightly different format and uh, they're extremely gorgeous and this was the first painting i did based on their ideas but it was uh, a large it's a large painting it's four by uh, five by four i think mm -hmm. uh, that i started working in the studio before they kicked me out for the covid lockdown so when i come back came back to the studio i finished it uh, with already mindset working on those little ones first so my plan actually was slightly uh, uh, diverted. Uh, so I wanted to make big ones and never thought I will do small ones. But then again, lockdown changed everything. And do you, so you started, you said the first ones that you started, you had already had these black gessoed panels. Yeah, so did just, all of them start with the black base and then you work the color back over it? Yeah, uh, they would prepare uh, their boxes uh, uh, in a very you know long process. Uh, uh, the surface has to become completely matte and uh, completely pristine. So uh, I did kind of the same thing. I bought uh, just a uh, uh, you know particular matte uh, 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 matte finish black gesso, and that's how I prepare the uh, the, the surface. Mm -hmm. And then yes, you start building the color towards the viewer. And I tried to work on them again, but just somehow it doesn't work for me. I, once I finish the series, I move on. Right. Maybe I'll come back to it. But right now, I, it was really intense year making them uh, because uh, I'm, I'm sure some painters will uh, understand me. Uh, when you work large, it's really hard to uh, downscale yourself. Mm -hmm. Because uh, why I work four by four? Because it's a span of my arms. It's uh, It's my physical space. I can control it. But here I have to really shrink everything into, you know, table with a four zero brush, you know, instead of my large brush that I usually use. But it was very challenging and I really, really uh, actually happy with this outcome that in fact, I actually refused to give it to any galleries yet. I, I just keep it for myself, this body of work. That kind of became my collection of the Russian boxes. Right. Yeah. Well, and it really marks this moment in time for you, too. I mean, I don't mind uh, sending work out into public. That's, that's part of the job. But with this particular, I just decided to keep them for me for a while. Yeah. I can see why. They're beautiful. Yeah, yeah. And like I said, I like to live with the work that I like. Mm -hmm. so. And it's really nice seeing them so so many together. Yeah. They really uh, play off of each other. Uh, yeah, it was really uh, powerful. I, I didn't expect expect it because uh, uh, when I was working on it, you know, I will make one and put it aside, make another one. But uh, the moment when we put with uh, uh, the installers on the wall this whole thing, it actually gave me completely different uh, feeling about them. Mm -hmm. I'm glad that I didn't make one. I'm glad I did. I, I made twenty of them. You know, it was. Yeah. Uh, I, yeah, it really actually made me happy. You know, I don't know if uh, yeah. Yeah, it's always different moving the work out of your workspace, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. seeing it and seeing, and you, I mean, every time, at least the artists I've worked with, every time they've seen their work installed in a space and they get to see it over a period of time, they learn so much more and it just moves the work ahead. But this one's really, I think. This, this was, a, uh, it was a very quick afterthought because I remember it was one of those paintings that I didn't finish and I thought there was some space wall, uh, uh, wall space extra that I needed to fill in and uh, I quickly made, uh, I think, this painting, to fi quickly finished it, this painting for uh, to fit it into exhibition together. Mm -hmm. so if you look at the installation shot, there was one wall with the small ones and there was a wall with a th two or three larger works and in the middle we had the, uh, uh, the collection of boxes. Mm -hmm. I thought I it was how it has this kind of curtain effect. You've got the road, yeah. you've got a snapshot into this landscape. That's actually uh, transparent, you know, the square transparent. This is the work that led me into my new body of work that I'm trying to uh, find a meaning for. If we go to uh, maybe studio mm -hmm. shots, if we can yeah. find them. So let me, yeah. I think we put some at the end. This is in the studio. Mm -hmm. um, that's how they're, in, yeah, so this yeah. is more of a newer work right now. I'm trying to uh, sort out, uh, um, actually, I'm trying to find a focus where to go to now with uh, mm -hmm. current state of mind. 
And um, so I had this idea to use, um, to ask uh, uh, some of my uh, very minimal connections back home now. Um, so those friends of mine, once in a while, they send me pictures of our, just our neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And um, I kind of gave a working title to this work, uh, to this body uh, work, um, uh, pictures uh, through my friend's eyes, pictures of my home through my friend's eyes, kind of like that. It's a little bit long right now. I need to figure out how to put it in a more compact English, but that, that's the idea. It's a bit nostalgic. It's a bit, uh, uh, you know, homesick, uh, but I'm trying to use that kind of negative stuff instead of sliding into depression like I had last year. Uh, yeah. And, you know, and to move on, you know, right. make some kind of a sense of what's going on and move on and uh, kind of uh, hopefully to have light at the end of the tunnel. There's this one too. Yeah, so all the pictures are, uh, you know, very typical shots from uh, uh, St. Petersburg uh, downtown area where I grew up. Yeah, we have that huge river that uh, is quite beautiful. And uh, so I start with their photographs. I don't even ask them what to take the picture of. Just send me something that you've seen today, for example, kind of like this mm -hmm. journaling uh, uh, on their behalf. Uh, and then, um, you know, trying to see what well actually they're so raw these paintings uh, they might be looking good for viewers but for me i haven't really made sense out of them yeah you're, they're still in process but i do love this curtaining effect that you're working with kind of on the edges yeah it's actually a, a kind of a, a allegorical in a way so it's kind right. of like uh you know um i'm a common people right i'm just opening the window shades and looking outside what the hell is going out there and closing them back because i don't want to see it anymore right it's kind of peeking through the curtains yeah well this is really beautiful we're at time dimitri the hour That's went fine. by really uh, quickly and i just want to say thank you for sharing all your time with us and yeah, your well, work thanks for getting me out of my uh dusty box yeah, i know you've been a, you've been a hermit yeah, yeah, that's that's okay. Um, any questions maybe from audience? Do you see anything? I haven't seen anything come in. Oh, here's uh, Patrick Brennan says, hi, Dimitri, I'm a big fan of your work. You pointed out- I know, out Patrick. I know, I know. prized uh, cure poster at the beginning of this call. Has the music you loved informed your practice or aesthetic? Also, if the upcoming cure album is so good, why isn't it out yet? <laughs> uh well i mean uh i'll call robert uh, tomorrow uh oh, find good. out for you. yeah 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 uh but music uh of course i mean it plays a huge part uh in you know and especially patrick you know how much i collect uh but i wouldn't say that it directly uh you know affect my work it's just a really beautiful soundtrack uh that i choose to work with and sometimes lately actually it became silence i don't want anything uh, uh in in my studio Mm -hmm. maximum maybe some uh, good classical uh, uh you know lately i've been listening a lot of opera you know nice well and i brought this picture up just because on the right you can see all the cds and the oh this is just you... a practice yes you... i know <laughs> <laughs> yes uh, uh, I, I, I think i can open them uh, maybe that would be my next uh, uh you know spin on life opening a record store uh, out of my collection our friend Mark uh, Mulroney wants to know, um, uh, you were a figurative painter when you guys met. So is there any chance you'll return to that? I actually, Mark, uh, you know, you remember why I switched from figure. Uh, I mean, it was a big no-no thing, you know. Uh, you remember that. But uh, yes, I did some uh, figurative stuff just lately, but more as a, uh, a, as a gift for friends. But I think uh, to use the figure now in my life, it has to be a good reason for that. Mm -hmm. Right now I'm in a very misanthropic stage of my life. I don't care about humanity. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and um, uh, Craig Cully is asking, are you teaching anywhere? Yeah, uh, when I left U of A, I actually, in Austin, I taught for uh, a year and a half, I think at the St. Edwards University. Uh, now I'm teaching at, uh, local school in Ogden called Weber State University. And I have to tell you, I'm very happy to work there. I can tell those students from the small town, they really need uh, exposure to the larger world. And I really feel the uh, results. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm doing it actually more as a volunteer rather than, it's not a really big money-making uh, at all. It's just, I really like uh, the, the 
the students especially uh, that's what i you know really excited about and i'm coming back for their uh, i just agreed to make another semester with them well and you're good with students well it, it's for them to decide well i've seen you you're good okay. with the students All right. well. <laughs> so i think we're out of time dimitri all right it was fantastic and everyone i just want to let you know we're meeting with um tom nectal is our next hi to him i haven't seen him in a while yeah well hopefully you can join in on the the okay. discussion in august and right. um yeah, so he's our next one. And so I hope everybody will sign on and participate. And in the meantime, have a great summer. And I'll talk okay. to you soon. Thank you, Dimitri. Bye.